Doc on the Run. We help injured runners run. All right, today on the Doc on the Run podcast, we're talking with Eric, who is known on Instagram as the Bionic Runner and on Twitter as Bionic Runner. And I found Eric and really wanted to have him on the show because I think he's going to share some really inf- useful information with all of us. And the reason I wanted to have him on is that Eric is one of those people who actually had to have a total joint replacement surgery and he's still running and he's killing it in his training too. So he posts all of his uh, runs, his workouts. You can see how great he's doing. And I really do think it's important to, to share his story. So um, he's agreed to come on the show today, mainly because you know many runners are just told they have to stop running when their joints start to wear out. And doctors often, I think they're well-meaning, but they frighten us into stopping running. And that also happened to me. Um, that was why I was so attracted to his story. Before I went to medical school, I raced motorcycles professionally and may not surprise you to hear I got injured while racing motorcycles. In fact, I got injured a bunch of times. One of those injuries resulted in me having to have two surgeries on my left knee. Now, the second surgery was actually a reconstructive surgery. So I still have big screws in my leg and one of the screws actually sticks out the front of my shin uh, just below my knee. But the important point here is that after that reconstructive knee surgery, my doctor, who was a totally reputable university physician who taught orthopedic surgery, he told me that if I were to run, that I would have to have total joint replacement surgery within 10 years. And more importantly, he also told me that I would not be able to run with a total knee replacement, a total joint would fail, and I would ruin my knee if I were to run on it after I had surgery. So since that time, I've continued to run. Um, It's been about 25 years since I had that surgery, and I was told that I wouldn't be able to run or I'd ruin my knee. So obviously, you know, uh, it's worked out fine. I mean, I've done lots of marathons. I've done 15 Ironman races, including the World Championships in Hawaii. And at one point, I was an Ironman all-world athlete. And this year, when I turned 50, I did my first 50-mile trail race. So with my experience, again, you know, uh, results may not be typical, all that sort of stuff. All I can say is my doctor was wrong and your doctor might be wrong too. So today what Eric's going to do is he's going to share his story and help you understand all the considerations you should really think about in relation to running and total joint surgeries if you feel like you have a worn out joint or some doctor tells you you have to stop running. So um, Eric is going to, you know, really help you put all of that advice in the proper perspective. And if you're seriously bummed out, just because some doctor told you you simply would not be able to run with a total joint replacement, you need to listen to this episode closely. So there's one person on the planet who I think can really provide the proper perspective and inspiration for runners considering a total joint surgery. It is Eric. So Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. I I happen to see that one of your recent guests was uh, Mark Allen. Yeah, uh, I was amazed by that. I told my kids, you know, I'm just a nobody. You know, Mark Allen is somebody I, I followed as a teenager. Loved to watch him and uh, Scott Molina and Dave Scott and all those guys battle it out every year at the Ironman. And so, that was amazing that you had him come on. It was just really neat to hear him speak. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Mark Allen, of course, one of the greats. I mean, you know, in the ESPN called him the greatest endurance athlete of all time, right? So he's one of my heroes as a kid. Sure. Uh, and so it really was interesting to be able to just talk to him. But, you know, one of Mark Allen's big thing is making sure that you can continue to exercise for a lifetime, not just a short period of time. And sure. uh, obviously, uh, that's been important to you. So why don't you just before we get started here, why don't you just give us a little bit of background kind of about you and your running history, how long you've been running and all that sort of stuff. Sure, sure. So uh, I started running. It, it's kind of interesting. I was a paper boy delivering a weekly newspaper as, a, as an 11 year old child. And on the front page, it talked about this boy coming to my hometown to run the marathon there. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, I'd love to try that. I'd love to run a marathon and see what that's like. And so I talked to my mom and my mom certainly had a lot more wisdom than I did. She said, you know, why don't you try the 10 K first? You know, there's a 10 K along with the marathon. Try that. See if you, you know, if you like that, and you can always do more later. And so uh, right before I turned 12, I signed up for that uh, 10K. And, and my mom was right, you know, I, I did it. And I thought, my gosh, this is this is six miles, that's forever. And so I, I finished that and, and certainly then got to bit by the, the running bug. Now, throughout my teenage years, running was a way to stay in shape for other sports. I, mm-hmm. I wrestled in high school and played football and played tennis 
Um, I did gymnastics. And so running was a way to stay fit. And so I enjoyed it, but it wasn't the main thing I did. When I moved to college, you know, college gets really intense with a lot of the, the work you have to do. And so I moved to running being my primary sport because you could go out and get a run in at any time, you know, anywhere, just put on your shoes and, and get out there. And so that became my thing. And so throughout my 20s, I, I was running quite a bit, not not running to be super fast or super competitive, but just to do something I loved, you know, quite, quite often. And then when I was 29, I thought, well, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm about to be 30. I want to do something significant here. And so one of the things I decided to do was enter my first marathon, see oh, okay. what that was like. And once again, you know, I trained, you know, I, I probably did a couple 15 mile runs, but I didn't do anything beyond that. Just kind of jogging, you know, log, logging those miles. And I did it and it was fun. I probably finished in around 425. And I thought, well, you know, that was good. I, I enjoyed it. I might want to do more of these. And so I started doing a marathon or two, maybe even three a year. But once again, just enjoying the experience, jogging through them. Um, about 32, though, I started getting this slight hip pain in my right hip, chronic hip pain all the time. And I thought, well, that's weird. You know, this, this pain never goes away. And, uh, you know, it, I tried to do whatever I could, uh, maybe take, you know, over the counter uh, uh, things like Aleve or, or, you know, ibuprofen, whatever. And that maybe helped a little bit at first. I, I switched shoes to go more maximalist type of shoes. Um, I started getting some maybe uh, uh, massages, things like that, just to try to help it out a little bit. Did a lot of stretching. Um, it kept doing the marathons and uh, just, just loved it. When I was about 40 then, I decided to take it seriously and train really hard. And, and so met up with some people that uh, really valued their opinion. Uh, really, really good runners, D1, a lot of D1 runners, and, and tried to glean everything I could from, from their perspective. All the while, my hip was getting worse. My right hip was getting worse and worse and um, was trying to just fight, you know, through the pain, basically. And so, uh, you know, I did that through the, my 40s, most of my 40s, and um, qualified for Boston, ran Boston, uh, did great in my age group in a bunch of uh, ways. Uh, was an ambassador for Ultra and some other folks and, and had a great time. But when I got to about 46, um, it really, my right uh, hip was really hurting and there really wasn't anything I could do anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started going to different uh, surgeons, see what could be done. I came upon a man who had been trained in Chicago and was down now in Knoxville where I'm from. And, uh, he was very uh, optimistic about my opportunity to run beyond uh, the surgery. You know, he said, I will do a, an anterior entry into your hip, which will allow for uh, you to get back quicker and, and be probably stronger to keep that hip capsule stronger. And um, he said, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of data on what will happen when you run with a hip replacement. He said, we don't we don't take a bunch of hip replacement people and say, we're going to put you through this because that's not really ethical for us to do. So he said, if that's what you want to do, then that's what we'll do. And uh, so we went through the whole process of getting me ready. I ran a few more marathons. I ran, a, uh, I had, mar I had hip surgery in March of 2016. And so in December of 15, I ran my final marathon with my real hip. And, you know, it, it hurt terribly. Um, I think I ran like a 342, you know, got through it and uh, then got ready for the hip replacement. At, at this point, you know, I had very little mobility uh, in my hip. Um, I was doing everything I could to try to keep going. Um, I, I basically was compensating. Everything was kind of, uh, you know, getting out of alignment. Basically, was at that point, I, was, I had gone to physical therapy and he, physical therapist and he said you know eric you're you're basically using your left leg to do everything now uh it's about 20 percent stronger than your right leg mm -hmm. so you really got to do something here uh and so i went and had the surgery done in march 
of 2016. So that's, that's what, you know, kind of led me to it, just running out of options at that point. And, um, and my doctor was one of those doctors, while he was very optimistic, he said to me, you know, I'm only going to do um, the anterior uh, surgery with uh, a certain series of components. Um, my hip replacement, just to, just to give you a little more detail, is a titanium spike in my femur with a uh, ceramic ball and a titanium cup in my pelvis with a, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a plastic, high density plastic cup with a titanium backing. He would not do a metal on metal. I know some people have a metal ball in their hip and my surgeon would not do that because in his opinion, he wasn't sure, although the stability might be a little better, he wasn't sure what those metal ions would do in the bloodstream uh, after a while. And so he wanted to just do the, the ceramic ball. And so, you know, it, 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 that's what we went with. And so that's, that's basically the history leading up to the surgery. Okay. So I know a lot of people that wind up with a total joint replacement. I mean, your other hips fine, right? Like you said, it was 20% well, stronger or, well, the or are you kind of wearing it out because you're overusing it? Right. It, see, as a gymnast over the years, I did gymnastics till I was about 23 and I'm 50 now. And so in my doctor's opinion, all the, the pounding, all the landing, uh, awkwardly under rotating, over rotating, you know, compensating, um, that's probably what did a lot of the damage when I was in my late teens and early 20s doing lots and lots of gymnastics and just my hip having to take all that beating mm -hmm. off balance sort of stuff. That's probably what did it, you know. And so my left hip is getting worse and worse at this point to the point where at, in a, maybe a year or two, I will get that one replaced as well. And But the good news is I don't have any uh, misgivings about what will happen. I have, I'm not worried. I'm not afraid. I will just do it, and I will rehab it, and I will be a runner with two fake hips at that point, and that will be fine. Right. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's the thing is that, you know, we always think, okay, you have to have some kind of trauma, been in a car accident or some, you know, skiing accident or something that destroys your joint or the other side of it is that so many doctors without any real data, frankly, will say, well, we think if you run a lot, you're going to wear out your joints. And there's not really a lot of scientific evidence to support that idea. But on the flip side of that, it's really interesting because you said, you know, your doctor just said, um, well, look, you know, Eric, we don't have a lot of data to show what happens when people run in these implants. It might be okay. It might not be okay. But on the other side of that, a lot of doctors will say, well, we just think that's a bad idea. So you just frankly shouldn't do it. So I think a lot of doctors will, without evidence, try to convince you not to run just because they're worried for you and for your, you know, overall health and the, the health of your implant, your joint, whatever. Um, but you were lucky to find a doctor, I think, who was willing to say, hey, you know, we don't really know one way or the other. And um, a while back, maybe, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I had um, Dr. Kevin Stone on the show, and he's developed a number of different joint implants. He's, you know, patented a number of different um, total joint replacement procedures and instruments and so on. And when I told him my story about how, you know, my doctor actually told me that I would not be able to run on it, he just said, you know, the only thing that points to actually is how poorly we as physicians can actually predict the future, regardless of who someone is or what activities they want to do. And it's totally true. So no one knows. No one knows if you'll run successfully for another 40 years. We don't know. Sure. You know, and nobody knows. So when you finally decided to make that um, leap and go ahead and have the joint replaced, obviously you ran this, you know, roughly 340 marathon it was very painful was it really the pain or was it that your i mean it was just not enjoyable or that your athletic performance was so um off compared to what you're used to like was it really the slowing down or the hurting or the frustration what was it that really led you to really go okay i've had enough i'm going to get a total joint replacement it, it was funny it's it, um it wasn't the slowing down necessarily. It was the, when I would run, that was about the only time that my pain would significantly decrease. That was the odd part because I'm a, I'm a midfoot striker. So mm -hmm. when I would, when I would be start running, it would, pit, it would be about 11 minutes, 12 minutes of excruciating pain. But then 
everything would numb out mm -hmm. and I would be able to do it. But the moment I stopped, it would be horrendous pain. Just, uh, you know, moving around, sitting, standing, could never get comfortable. Um, it was funny that the year before I had my surgery or even a few, I'd say six months before my surgery, my family, we went to Myrtle Beach and, and we were we were walking around from uh, venue to venue and I just, I could not keep up. And so I actually told my wife, I'm going to run ahead to the next place wow. and you meet me there when you, you know, you'll walk there and you'll meet me there because it was more comfortable to run down the street than it was to walk down the street. And so that's why, that's where we got to that my daily life, it, you know, when I wasn't running, the pain was just so terrible that I was like, I, I just got to get this done. You know, I mm -hmm. couldn't take it. Oh, that's interesting because most of the time when someone asks me, should I have surgery? I basically tell them there are only two reasons you should have surgery. Reason number one is you have pain that actually limits the athletic activities you want to do. And in your case, those athletic activities actually made it better, not worse. And, you know, and which is really unusual, but, you know, obviously if you would run on it, it would feel good because of the endorphins while you're running. Um, within, you know, what you said, 10 minutes or 11 minutes or something like that. And then it would hurt worse later because you basically just inflamed it after you, right. you ran. Um, and then, you know, the second reason I tell people to have surgery is that, well, if you don't have surgery, you're going to wind up with a worse procedure later. But mm -hmm. when you're talking about a total joint, there is no worse procedure, right? That's, I mean, you're taking out the joint, you're putting in a fake one. Uh, it's artificial. We don't know how it's going to do. You hope it's going to last forever, but you don't really know. So there are all these unknowns around it. And when you add all those unknowns, I mean, I know you said now you're very comfortable with the idea of having the second hip replaced. Like you have no concerns about that because you know what to expect. You know what the rehab is going to be like. You know that you already did it the first time. So it's going to be easier to do it the second time. You know, probably I would think some things you might do differently that would help with that whole process. But that first time you had none of that experience, you had none of that security and you had no one, frankly, like you sharing their experience to tell you it was going to be okay. So what was that like emotionally for you? Well, you know, it's something, if, if you can think of something you just love to do, something that um, is sort of the, the, the one go-to hobby that you enjoy more than anything. You know, I, I, uh, I think in advance, you know, of all these races I want to do and it, I sort of um, live my life, you know, of course, I, I love being a husband and a father and all that, but my one personal investment in something is running. And so to not have that goal ahead of me was devastating. You know, mm -hmm. when, I, when I did that last marathon with my real hip, I thought, well, gosh, you know, um, if I don't get to run again, what am I going to do? Um, I don't like to ride a bike. Sorry to all you triathletes out yeah. there. I don't really like riding a bike. I don't like really like swimming. I, uh, I, I love the intensity of running. Is there something out there that's as intense as that, but, but is, it does, won't hurt my joints. And so I, I thought, well, gosh, you know, what am I going to do? Um, but you know, once again, the, the, I had to face the fact that my day to day life was just so difficult with this pain it it changed my whole demeanor mm. um you know how i parented how i how i lived because i was just always in so much pain that i thought you know i i, I just that's that's more important ultimately yeah. the quality of my life day to day um and so that's why i finally moved forward plus my once again my surgeon he was so good so optimistic he I talked to him about it. I said, well, you know, once we get started here, if I do, if I am able to run again, uh, what, what will be, you know, what we kind of do? And he said, well, you know what, my, my goal will be to let you start running. Um, you'll put many more cycles through your hip than normal people. So there'll come a time when you'll need it replaced much earlier than the normal person will. He said, I'll check it at least every two years, take x-rays at some point, you know, if everything works out, my goal is to go back in, to take that ball off, to put in a new ceramic ball and to set you loose, just like going to get your car work done, mm -hmm. to get, you know, get the, you know, the preventative maintenance done. And then you'll have to do the rehab again, which isn't necessarily fun. But when that's done, send you on your way. And so, yeah. you know, it, it, it just was, he was so encouraging. 
Um, my wife has been so supportive. My kids have been so supportive, you know, in that, you know, saying, you know, daddy, whatever you want to do, if you can, if you physically can run, we support you in trying to do this. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it was, it was some people, you know, around me, but also me just saying, well, I'm going to just go for it because my day-to-day life is just so, so painful otherwise. Yeah. You know? One of my good friends um, who had a hip replacement at about the same age you did, uh, we used to ride bikes together. And I actually remember at least 20 years ago, um, he was, we were on a bike ride and he was talking about his hip and he waited and waited and waited um, and talked about how he was always in pain. You know, he, every day at work, all that kind of stuff, he was in pain on a daily basis, but there's this sort of, you know, stigma attached to a hip replacement that would define him as old in some way. And he told me one day over lunch that that really is why he waited so long. But most importantly, when he finally had the surgery, we were having lunch one day after he'd had surgery and it was only like a month after. I mean, he hadn't actually recovered from it, you know, and uh, he was still in the midst of all the rehab. And he said, it is astonishing how much better I feel throughout my entire body now that that daily pain is gone. And yeah. it's one of those things where I think it creeps up. You know, you've, you, your hip is getting worse over time. It is getting more and more painful. But because it's happened kind of gradually and because you're an athlete and because you're used to tuning out pain, you can in large part tune it out. But if that pain that you had at the end were to be inflicted on someone immediately and at that intensity, they would find it absolutely intolerable. Mm. So, you know, I think it's, um, it's tough to make that call of when to do it. For a lot of runners, it's like when they know they can't do what they want to do. But the pain part, I think, is a little more difficult to manage. So, you know, before your surgery, I know you talked to a number of different doctors, but did most of them tell you you should stop running in order to preserve your natural joint? Oh, yes. Most people said, uh, you know, you, you probably need to stop. In fact, my general, you know, physician for years had said to me, you know, Eric, it'd probably be a good thing if you stop running. Uh, you know, you, you, I don't know why you're, you're putting yourself through this. Uh, your hip looks awful on the x-ray and your other hips only, you know, 10 years behind maybe. And so you, you really need to stop. And it, it, I just couldn't, I mean, it, it's just something that I love dearly. And, and you were talking about why I waited so long or why people, some, some people wait so long for me, it was the unknown, the fear of the unknown. You know, I would have probably had it done a few years before, but I wasn't sure if mm-hmm. I'd be able to run again. So basically I said, well, you know, I'm just going to tough it out because this might be the last marathon I do, or this might be the last race I do. And so, uh, that's why it took so long. That's, that's also why, you know, when I get the next one done, I'll, I won't wait nearly as long you know, for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so, I mean, it's good that you were able to find doctors who were supportive of you actually making that transition after the, uh, after the surgery to get back to running. But what about your friends and family? Uh, I know all the time I talk to runners, I hear this over and over where our friends and family, the people that care about us the most, will try to discourage us from running when they see that running in some way causes pain, right? Sure. So sure. did your family try to convince you to stop running during that period where you were trying to sort out whether or not to have the joint replacement? I think my immediate family didn't because they saw every day my passion for it. So, you know, uh, just like daddy does this, he does this, he does this. Daddy, part of daddy's identity is he is a runner. He <laughs> goes out and does running, you know. And so they saw how much I loved it and how it would just kill me to not be able to do it. And so for them, it was, we're going to support you in this no matter what. For people outside that immediate family, yes. You know, my mother um, was like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> why? Why you go and put yourself through that? Or my, my mother-in-law, she was like, well, that's just ridiculous. That's your, <laughs> you're putting yourself through all this pain. You know, you can find something else to do, surely. Um, so, yeah, the, the immediate family, very supportive. The rest of the folks thought I was just crazy. But to be honest, now people sort of see me as this testament to what is possible. And so it's, it's totally reversed you know, people, from my, my high school buddies, my college buddies, uh, people who I ran with before the surgery, they're like, man, you're like, you're like Superman. You're like, you know, you're, uh, you're like this, this amazing uh, bionic. That's why I started with Bionic Man, because they're like, it's like you're this bionic man now. You run like 
you did before and you don't even have your real body part in there, you know, anymore and you're still doing it. So it's become different now. Now I'm an advocate for things and people uh, have interest in it instead of before just writing it off as just this crazy pipe dream that Eric's going to try to do, you know? So it, it's, right. it's really great now. Oh, that is great. And, and again, that's why I wanted to have you on the show is, you know, to, to help people understand that the stories we're told by well-meaning professionals who are in a position of authority are not always right. And I know before that we came on to start the interview, you said you were a minister. And I would imagine that as your role as a minister, a big part of your job is actually to help people in your congregation understand that whatever they're going through, when it's difficult, when they can't see the way out, your job is to help them understand that it can be better. It can be different. And I really and truly think that's much of what you're doing with all the stuff you're posting, showing us that, look, most people that look at your post wouldn't ever be able to run that fast. And they see you're doing it with an artificial joint. Well, it's all the more impressive. And, you know, and I think that's really it. We get scared that we're not going to be able to run, that if we do, we're going to be slow. And frankly, we get scared of the, the procedure itself. The whole idea of going to an operating room sounds scary. I mean, horror movies have scenes about the operating room, right? So, you know, tell us about the surgery. How did it go? How did, how did the actual joint replacement surgery go for you? Was it as you planned or was it different than you expected? Well, sure. Uh, let me just say back to what you were saying there real quick about, about uh, what I do for a living. Um, yeah, it, you know, everybody has a, a motivator in their life, something that helps them see beyond themselves what might be possible uh, just when you take normal stock of things. And so for me, um, I had tremendous faith in things beyond what I can readily imagine or see. Mm -hmm. And so even though everybody said to me, well, you really can't do that. I tell people all the time, you know, just, just have faith that, that there's more out there than what is right. readily available for you to, to see, uh, to visualize. And so I, I sort of lived by those, those ideas myself as I was moving forward with this decision. Um, now, as, as far as the surgery, um, you know, there, there was a lot to do to prep for that, a lot of things to, to do blood, blood work and all that stuff. And so finally, it seemed like forever. Um, initially, I guess, too, I had done some things with my doctor, you know, tried all these different exercises through physical therapy, and actually had tried to take uh, Celebrex, an anti-inflammatory, uh, but it really didn't make much of a difference, and my liver almost immediately got sensitive to, you know, to that medication. So um, once we got that all out of the system, I could finally go in for the surgery. Um, it, it was... It was great. I was his first patient of the day, which I thought was great. He was fresh, you know. You, I thought, like, good. I'm the first guy. So, so he, I got in there. Um, I woke up after the surgery, and the first thing I noticed was there was no chronic pain. Like I had no pain in that leg, in that hip, and so that was wonderful. Um, that night, I started walking on it with a walker. And uh, once again, I was amazed. Now, of course, some of that was probably some of the, the medication they used for the surgery itself, of course. Um, I, I saw the doctor that night about 10 o'clock at night. I was walking down the hallway with my walker, and he, he approached me from the other end, and you know, we started talking about it. And I said, you know, this is amazing, you know, that I don't have this chronic pain that I'm dealing with. And so I, I uh, did a few things the next day in the hospital with all these other joint replacement people, they all looked at me kind of funny because most of them were 60, 70, 80. You know, I was 47. So, you know, they thought it was kind of funny that somebody my age was doing it. And, and so I did all the, the, the uh, hip, they, they give you a bunch of hip uh, class uh, work with a lot of notes, you know, what you need to do once you leave the hospital. So I got all my notes, how to get in and out of the shower, how to get in and out of the car, all these basic things, and then started my rehab. Um, I, I was assigned to do, uh, all this stuff at home, which I did religiously. I did my rehab at home, uh, morning and night, all the exercises I was assigned. I did them all. Um, I was also assigned to go to 18 sessions of physical therapy, uh, six weeks, three times a week. I did all that exactly as I was supposed to, but, you know, it, it was amazing. My mother-in-law got her hip replaced at the same time that I did. And while she 
you know, she was about 75. Um, she didn't do the rehab as religiously as I did. And now my mother-in-law has no strength in that leg. None. I mean, she has to physically grab that leg and basically, you know, pick it up and put it where she wants it to be. Of course, there's no pain, which is great, but she has no strength. And, and so, you know, I really think the rehab is just what is, you know, so important, you know, doing all the things the doctors tell you. Uh, you know, I, I can certainly, you want me to go into that a little bit more, some of the rehab that, that I did and kind of the timeline? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that would be really useful to talk about the rehab. But, you know, one of the things you just talked about that I think is really important and key is that before you had the surgery, you were sort of told and given all this, these homework assignments and stuff on like things you need to practice before you have surgery, mm, how yes. to go to the bathroom, how to get in and out of the shower safely, how to get in and out of bed safely, right? Like right. those are critical things. And it's so fascinating because I think overwhelmingly people who are considering surgery, they think I need the best doctor who is going to do the best procedure with the best implant or gizmo. And the fact is, no matter who the doctor is, the procedure itself is a very, very small fraction of the entire equation. It's important to have a good doctor, no doubt. It's important to do the right stuff in the operating room, for sure. But what you as a patient who wants to get back to running does after the surgery and also before the surgery to prepare your body for what's about to happen is really what determines, I think, who is going to get better and who is not. So along those same lines, aside from learning the things that they gave you on your homework sheet, I would imagine you also did some kind of like, you know, prehab stuff, right? Something to become even stronger so that when you went to the operating room, you were completely and totally fit as much as you could be because then obviously you're going to lose your fitness from there so your mother-in-law loses a lot of fitness but she's starting from a place of relative uh weakness compared to you right sure. so sure. so what did you do for prehab did you do a bunch of stuff before the surgery is there anything in particular yeah I, you know for the most part because i had such a base of athletic experience and fitness you know, I didn't do a lot. There are people, of course, that have to do a lot of prehab. Um, I was running up to right before the surgery still. I mean, still, you know, just doing kind of junk miles. I mean, just to be out there. So I was still doing a lot of stretching, a lot of uh, physical therapy moves that strengthen the pelvis um, and everything around it. Those are things I had been doing, though, to try to hold on to my ability to do it. Um, but once again, that right leg was getting so immobile, it, it was starting to almost uh, be fused to my lower back where mm -hmm. I'd have to use it all as one unit, you mm -hmm. know. And, and so uh, once again, it, more than anything, it was becoming educated about what was about to happen. You know, what, it, what is a anterior uh, hip replacement, total hip replacement? How does that work? And so actually I went and watch YouTube videos about the surgery and, and what did they do and, and what will it look like when it's done and, and what should I expect from um, my muscles that have been cut or pushed aside, you know, what, what's going to happen. And so um, I, I basically did a lot of homework to learn about the procedure and what to expect my body to feel like once I was done. Yeah, that's important. I mean, and there's so much information available now and maybe, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago, I actually created a video on total joint replacement in the big toe joint. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a bunch of images and I mean, they're actual surgical images. So yeah, it's kind of gruesome if you're not prepared to see that. And I remember I showed it to someone and she said, oh my gosh, you're not actually going to put that on the internet, are you? <laughs> and N not kidding. I was, I actually thought about it. I was like, well, I don't want to freak people out or anything. You know, that's not my intent here. And, and it really, it really kind of um, made me think about it. And I actually yeah. delayed putting it up for at least another year or two. And then yeah. one day I finally just thought to myself, she doesn't know what she's talking about. You know, I think this is useful. I'm going to put it up. And now I think that thing's had over half a million views or something. And mm -hmm. You know, and there's there's that sort of stuff on virtually every topic now. So when I put it up, yeah, it was a little unusual to to post what seemed to be very 
you know, graphic surgical images. Mm. That's just not the case anymore. You can see every part of every surgical procedure that's ever been done just on YouTube, you know, and, sure. and it does help you, I think. And, you know, if you're squeamish, maybe not, but for most people who really want to understand the process, who really want to understand exactly what's going to happen and, you know, why you can or cannot do certain things like the way you get into or out of the shower, you know, or when you start exercising, it's really crucial. Um, mm. So, I mean, that really does, um, I think, you know, speak though to, um, you know, how thoughtful you've been about the whole process and really, you know, that whole thing, there's nothing to fear, but fear itself. Right. Um, mm. And sounds like you delayed surgery. I mean, you know, longer than you needed to probably. Uh, but, you know, you have to get to the point where it seems like you're comfortable. And it's the right decision for you. So then after you got out of the operating room, you know, and you were ready to go and they kind of cleared you to start rehab. I mean, you're walking on it this basically the same day. Right. And then right. where did rehab go from there? What was that process like? Sure. Well, I did everything probably faster um, than most people and maybe too fast at some points. Um, I, uh, I had a walk for maybe a day or two and I'd walk around my neighborhood. Uh, then I moved to a cane after a couple of days. Uh, then I started carrying the cane around after about four days because I, you know, I just thought, well, if I need it, I'll have it. But if I don't, I'll just carry it. Um, once again, there was really no, um, no, no backsliding mm -hmm. as far as that first, you know, uh, I'd say nine weeks went. Everything in the first nine weeks was very quick, uh, rebounded very fast. Uh, at nine weeks, I probably um, did something I shouldn't have done, but it didn't hurt me. So I did it. Um, I started uh, granny shuffling downhill. And so I would, I would walk and I'd walk up hills. But then if I found a downhill that was rad, rather gradual, I would just try to granny shuffle down it, you know, and, and, and that felt fine. And so I, I did that I, all the while I was doing my rehab religiously. I mean, just killing it with rehab. Um, I was doing a lot of bike because they made me do a lot of, of cycling and stuff uh, to kind of get that hip going through, you know, the motions. Um, and then at 12 weeks, really, is when my hip surgeon said, okay, you're clear. You can start doing anything you want. Um, the running stuff, you know, the more intense movements, just be careful. Uh, maybe slower pace, lower miles, but you're clear. You're clear to do it. And so I started, um, just an aside, something that happened to me almost immediately, and I don't know if it's related, but I started getting this terrible pain in my, at the base of my neck. And I, I came to find out that I got a bulging disc in, in, in my neck. I don't know. It was, so that was a little setback because I had to figure out, okay, how do I manage this, this, this bulging disc? That has since abated and we're good with that. No worries there. But that was a little thing that I thought, well, gosh, you know, I'm just getting down with this hip replacement and now I need to figure out how to deal with this bulging disc. So, uh, I started, you know, I, did, I took care of that as I was starting to run. Um, I, I started running. It felt really good. Um, about five months after my hip replacement, I ran my first half marathon again. And I did, you know, pretty well. I was very encouraged. I ran it um, a couple minutes faster than I had run it the year before with my hip hurting so bad. <laughs> so, so I felt, you know, I felt like, okay, I'm two minutes faster than what I was with my real hip just killing me. So things are good. Um, I continue to run all fall, increasing the intensity, increasing the mileage because my goal was to run a marathon a year after my surgery. And so I did that, felt great. As I got about seven or eight months out, um, I noticed some nerve pain where I would be running and when I would run a faster paced workout, I'd get some nerve pain where um, it would kind of run down my leg and uh, get some weakness in my leg. And ultimately, my right leg, I, I, I lose some, some feeling in it. And so that was odd. And, and I didn't know how to approach that. Um, Talk to some physical therapists. They they decided that what had happened 
and this is why maybe when I get my next hip replaced, I'll know better. Uh, they decided that due to some weakness in my pelvis, some of the muscles that had been moved or, or cut or things like that, that my right side of my pelvis had slipped back and uh, was, was too far back, had, mm. had gone backward a little bit too much. And so I, I was prescribed physical therapy to help bring that right side of my pelvis forward again. And so I did a bunch of movements to work with bringing that right side of my pelvis forward. And it really helped and it, it has helped tremendously. And so I ran my first marathon after my surgery, um, a year, a year after my surgery and, and it went well. And I ran about three or four minutes faster than wow. I did my last marathon with my fake, with, with my real hip. Um, so I, once again, I felt good, but you know what I noticed when I was running that marathon, um, a year after my surgery, I noticed the first 15 miles felt great, but I had lost all of the, 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 the buildup, the base that I had gained before the surgery. And so those miles 16 through 26, they were very difficult to do, not because my hip hurt, but because aerobically, I just, I just didn't have it. And so that last 10 miles was so slow in comparison to what I was used to. So that's where I felt like, oh my gosh, this is where, where I'm going to have to build it back up now. It's the mm -hmm. last half of the marathon that I don't have anymore that I have to build up to. And so since that time, that would have been, oh, that would have been uh, March of 2017. So for the past two and a half years, what I've tried to do is build that second half of the marathon back up. And so that's what we've been doing. And, and, and I've had complications, I think, throughout the course of it. Like I said, that, that, that pelvis has, you know, it, on the right side has wanted to slip back. And so I've had to work with a physical therapist to build up my pelvis quite a bit, everything, getting it strong and stable, lots of core work. I have a whole team now of folks that I work with. I have a chiropractor, a massage therapist. I have my surgeon. I, I have some SI joint dysfunction. So I have a back guy that I work with now too. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's getting better. I, you know, I ran in, in April, I ran a marathon in 330, which, you know, isn't what I could do when I ran Boston, but it's the best I've done sit, since my hip surgery, you know. Uh, so I'm feeling good about that. Um, I'm running the New York City Marathon in November, and I feel good about my, you know, prospects there. And I've actually signed up to run a 50 miler in March. And wow. my wife thinks, you know, you're just crazy. But I said, honey, I turned 50. I want to run 50 miles. And so I'm going to run that. And then my surgeon has said, well, Eric, after you run that 50 miler, you come in and we'll look at your hips and we'll see, is it time for surgery on the other one? Or you know, can we push up to a 62 miler or can we, you know, what, what can we do? Mm -hmm. So, so that's the goal right now. I'm, I'm it's, and it's funny. I would say now after the hip surgery, it, it's kind of like, um, every month that I run is a blessing. Last month was tough. Last month I had some uh, injuries where I felt like, you know, I, I really don't feel that good. And so I ran about a hundred miles last month. I did a bunch of cross training. Uh, on the elliptical, on the bike, all that. This month, I'm killing it. I, I feel great. I've already put in about 120 miles, and the month is only two thirds over. Um, I coach middle school cross country, so I'm out running with them every afternoon. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's just. Uh, I take what I get. You know, some days I feel awesome, and I run, you know, 18 miles, and it's like, oh, this is great. And then other days I get out there and I think, eh, I, I feel kind of. I feel kind of bad today. And, and so, you know, you, you just, you just appreciate every single run. Now you don't take it for granted. You know, yeah. that's, that's the big difference. Yeah. Oh, that's all really helpful. And, and, you know, and it can go both ways, right? I mean, you said you kind of like push things a little bit, uh, but you didn't really set yourself back. You didn't have any big missteps along the way. And right. I have a friend who um, he actually, did have one of those missteps, but he would tell you, he would readily admit what he did was not a good thing. You know, it was a church basketball league right after his surgery, way too early. He decided to play and he dislodged the implant and had to have it revised. He had to have the whole surgery over. Well, 
that is not a good idea. What you did was not foolish. I'm sure there are many people who would say, if you think you're going to run a marathon one year after you have a hip replacement, you must be crazy. But that's a completely reasonable goal. If you said, I'm going to run a marathon a month after I had hip replacement surgery, well, most people would think you're crazy and understandably so because it's not healed. But in a year, you know, it's pretty well healed. It's just a lot of work to try to rehab it in that amount of time. And, and like you said, you at that point had not really gotten your aerobic base back. So you had to suffer at the end of the race, but you didn't have any misstep, missteps. And what I tell runners all the time is regardless of their injury, whether they've had surgery or not, you only have two choices. You can do the standard recovery that we think works for that injury or for that surgery or whatever and wait the normal timeline to, to end, you know, a year, year and a half or whatever, and then start retraining yourself to run again, or you can push the limits. You will have to experiment. But all along the way, you are healing. And all along the way that you're healing, you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So you can tolerate more and more activity throughout that entire course. And that is what I think most physicians are kind of nervous about because, well, we already know you're going to run a lot. You're going to train hard. You're dedicated. And so that kind of frightens practitioners to want to rein you back in and tell you to stop running. But you know, you've had a whole team of people helping you along. So it sounds like you really made some really good choices to, um, to get ready to run again. So right. is there anything when you really went from that switch from just being in the early recovery, you know, kind of walking to where you actually transitioned to running, you know, there is no data on that. If somebody says, well, if I replace my joint, when can I, you know, go for a jog? When can I run three miles? Nobody knows. So how did you make that decision? What did you do to prepare yourself to make that particular transition? Well, I think, you know, I, I just had to learn how my body felt. And I'm still learning that, to be honest, I, I, I made an appointment with my surgeon um, a couple weeks ago, because I, I had all this, what, what I've noticed is my right hip, after the surgery, I have all this extra mobility that I didn't have before, but things like my hip flexor can't handle it necessarily, because it's used to 15 years of less and less mobility so you know it, it now for the past three years it's had to get used to all this extra stuff that eric is doing and so a, a few weeks ago i was trying to do workouts that were far more intense as far as speed and i've noticed when i do the faster i run um the more my hip flexor feels you know gets gets a, rather bothered by that um, just thinking anatomically, as I push off with that right foot on the ground and that leg swings back, that is the hardest part of the movement for me right now from having the hip, the hip replacement. And so when I'm running hard and my, my push off is harder and my stride is more intense, um, it, it, it suffers. And so what I did uh, after I made the appointment with my surgeon, I went to my physical therapist and got all these exercises to help with that hip flexor. And so I canceled my appointment with my surgeon because, you know, that all worked. So my point is I, I'm still learning how to react to what my body's telling me. Um, you said making good choices. I will tell you that, of course, sometimes I make terrible choices. Like uh, a few weekends ago, my 14-year-old son he wanted to go play tennis and I said, okay, we'll go play tennis. And so I played tennis for like three hours with my 14 year old son. And while my right hip did great, you know, the replaced one, my left hip was like, what are you doing? You know? And so I said to my son after I said, until I get my left hip replaced son, I don't think I'm going to play tennis with you anymore <laughs> because that, that, that start, stop quickly adjusting left, right, front back that that really bothered my hip versus running where my my hip can count on going forward for miles after mile after mile after mile um so you know from the moment i got my new hip till now it's been a constant learning game mm -hmm. uh, from the moment i got released i had to think okay i'm gonna try to run all slow miles let's do let's just run uh, three to five miles today, all really slow. If I have to stop, I have to stop. If I don't have to stop, I'll keep going. I did that for a week or two, three to four miles, three to four times a week, three to five miles a day. 
it all felt good. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to sign up for this 10K um, three months after my surgery, and I'm just going to run it, and, and we'll see what happens. And I ran it, and, you know, I ran it uh, probably a, a few minutes, a uh, handful of minutes under what I would normally try to get. But um, just to be out there with these people who love to run and, and to not be in pain was great. And so I did that 10K and I thought, well, there's a half marathon coming up in a couple more months. I'm going to train for that, but I'm going to do mainly all easy miles. Um, I ran all easy miles for the next two months. And I actually only thought to myself, okay, I'm going to try to run for 90 minutes straight, just, how, just nice and easy. And I did that a few times before the half marathon. And then I ran the half marathon. And like I told you earlier, I ran it a couple minutes faster than I did the year before when I was in all this pain. So, you know, I knew my body was adjusting and was dealing with it okay. And so I said, well, you know, I've got, we've got this marathon in six more months. I'm going to sign up for it. And if I have to DNF, I add it, then that's fine. But otherwise, I'm going to do it. And so then I started adding, you know, a little bit, uh, uh, some other things, tempo runs, uh, you know, some interval training, some progressive pace things, you know, just trying to add in a few more things. But once again, always making sure, how's my body reacting? How, mm. how, how is it feeling? And do I have any sharp pain? No. Do I have any soreness? Yes. But, you know, we can ice it down and we can do some other things. And so that's, that's basically where we're at now. We just, we just feel it out and and see how what's going on and and how our body's responding and i sign up for these races and think yeah i do want to run a 50 miler in march if i get there healthy great if i have to set my sights lower we'll do that when we get there we'll, we'll, right. we'll adjust when we get there <laughs> yeah that makes sense well now you're in this place where you're thinking about your body you're under you know you're really paying attention to how your body feels as you're running and you're training you're making decisions on all these events that you're taking on but you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger and that obviously is one of the best parts of running when you can actually pay attention and see where you are and and see that you're improving and know that you know you have confidence that you will improve that's really easy but a really hard part of that is when the opposite is true. Like before your surgery, you were getting more and more and more pain. You were actually getting slower and slower. So regardless of your amount of dedication and the amount of time you were putting in, things were kind of getting worse and worse. So, you know, if you had to talk to one of your running buddies who has achy, creaky joints and they're trying to make a decision about whether or not they should stop running, or should they get a total joint replacement at some point in the future, you know, and they're trying, how, how would you advise them to kind of listen to their body now to help make that decision? Sure. I, you know, I would tell them, you know, I, I would show them, of course, my experience, which isn't necessarily typical. So you just have to take it for what it's worth. But um, I would say, you know, if you're passionate about running, um, by all means, do whatever you can to to continue to do so, but realize you might not have to follow the normal course of action. I certainly haven't done that. And so I've had to be creative in, in how I approach it and who I encourage to be part of my, my team of advisors, so to speak, so that I can continue. Um, my family, you know, hopefully that person would have supportive people around them. My wife has been so dedicated to saying, sure, honey, you, you do this, you invest, you know, it, it costs a little money for me to do all these things to have these, you know, a chiropractor and a massage therapist and all these things. But, you know, she's all about encouraging me because she understands how important it is to me. Mm. If, if this person decides, you know, I, I just, I don't have that support system. I don't have that motivation, that faith in, being able to, to, to do this, to run beyond the replacement. You know, I would say then you really should have the replacement for quality of life purposes, oh, that yeah. your quality of life demands that you have it. Don't be afraid of it. Um, day to day, my quality of life is so much better because I don't have chronic pain. I don't have to worry about it. And there's all these other things that I could try to do. I'm a very competitive person. So when I was thinking even about, gosh, if I get my next hip replaced and it doesn't work out as well, well, what am I going to do? And I thought, okay, I'm going to try to find something 
that I can be competitive in to, to, to fill that void. And so I would tell this person, go for it to try to run. And, you know, if it doesn't work out, then, then, then find something that you can invest your, your competitive spirit in. You know, I, I coach these kids now. And, and, and to be honest, um, the other coach, he doesn't run anymore. He just, you know, stands there and he, he, he shares his ideas about how to run from a position of, of just teaching. And, and that's a way that a lot of people can, can uh, sort of satisfy that, those, that competitive nature by leading others to run, by coaching others and, and working towards a, a, uh, a conference uh, title or a, you know, a district championship or a state championship. And so, you know, that's another way that, that people can give back to this sport that does so much, so much for us. So there, I guess I would tell the person once again, if you can do it, by all means, give it everything you have. If you can't do it, then find something else to invest your competitive nature in. And if, if you physically can't, can't do it yourself, then invest your competitive nature in others who can and teach them about your love your passion for running and, and be a champion for them, an advocate for them, a mentor for them. That's what I would tell them. Yeah, that's great. So for those runners who really are hopeful that they could have a total joint replacement and are considering joint replacement surgery, really want to get back to running. I know it's difficult to pick one thing, but if you could pick one piece of advice for them, what is the number one most important thing you think a runner who is considering joint replacement could do to really help optimize the chances that they could really and truly return to running after the surgery. Right. It, it, well, if they need to go forward with it, I believe, you know, go forward with the surgery because uh, it's only, you're only prolonging the inevitable. But once you do that surgery, you have to bust your rear end <laughs> afterwards. You have to put in the work. You have to put in the rehabilitation. You, you cannot just expect to be able to get out there and, and just kill it again, get right back at it. It's going to be a long road. It's going to be at least like, you know, we talked about a year for me as a marathoner to get back to, to the marathon. If you're just a 5 k -er and a 10 k -er and a half marathon guy or gal, then maybe, you know, then maybe you're talking six months of hard, hard work. But it's, it's once again, really listening to your body really get on getting on board with all sorts of therapy uh if if necessary and um, doing that rehab well like i said once again i've done as holistic an approach as i can i i became a vegan even uh because i had so many friends who were older runners who said you know eric i'm a vegan and it really helps with the inflammation in my body and my energy level i feel it's great because of my because of my digestive system and how it's dealing with my diet so, I mean, I've, I've gone full in, you know, and I, and, 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 and I, so I would tell people, you need to go all in, in this, do okay. the surgery, but then go all in, in the rehab and anything you need to, to get back out there. Oh, that's great. And that really is a big part of it, right? It's not just a sort of half doing it. If you really do it all the way, your chances are obviously going to be better. I mean, no question. I mean, and, and any runner understands that we know if a coach gives us a training plan, and we pick and choose which workouts we think we're going to do because they're the most important workouts. We are not going to have the best outcome when we run our race. You need to do the whole plan, right? Sure. Sure. So when you were going to um, find doctors that would actually help you, that really would be, you know, not just good technicians, good surgeons or good physicians, but they were going to be, you know, motivating, encouraging, uplifting, positive I mean, how did you set about establishing this team of people who really is not just your doctor, but the chiropractor, the massage therapist, all of the people that have, the physical therapists that have really helped you along your path? How would you, you know, advise somebody to look for and find those kind of people that would really be on their team? Sure, sure. I, I would say for me, the way I went about it, we're a college town. Knoxville is a college town. We have a, you know, division one school here in the University of Tennessee. Um, I, uh, went to talk to those people, all the people I knew who were D1 athletes or D1 coaches, uh, who were, uh, involved in the, the running scene, so to speak in my, in my town. And so they would point me to this 
this coach, this D1 coach, or um, that person who works on the athletes at the University of Tennessee, uh, this nutritionist who works with this person who was, uh, you know, a, a decathlete in the Olympics, or, you know, this, this surgeon like mine who works to uh, repair different things going on with uh, UT athletes. Uh, and so I did that. I, I went to all the people that the professional athletes and the, the D1 athletes and coaches told me, you need to see. You know, and, that, and that for me has worked out great to get into those circles of people to find out who are those folks who are keeping the D1 athlete, the, the Olympic athlete, the professional athlete going, um, you know, day to day. And that's really what worked yeah. out for me. Oh, that's good advice. I mean, you know, we always want to believe that everybody's being treated equally. And we want to believe that there's this idea that everybody deserves health care and that everybody's going to get health care. And that's just not how it works. I mean, you know, I mean, I love my country and everything, but the healthcare we have is not even for everyone. It's just not. In fact, when I lecture at uh, conferences on running injuries, like in, in a couple of weeks here, I'm going to be lecturing in Las Vegas at the International Foot and Ankle Foundation meeting all about running injuries. And many of the research studies, when I present those studies in lectures to physicians, and we're looking at how runners do with certain injuries, in all those studies, there are a couple of reasons they have to disqualify people and eliminate them. And one of those reasons is that they are elite athletes. So when you look at, you know, the incidence of running injuries and how people recover universally, the people who are um, elite athletes, professional athletes, they're eliminated with the thinking that, and it says over and over in these disqualifications that they're known to have earlier intervention, more supportive care and more attentive care than the average patient. Well, it's not complicated, right? I mean, if you have a, um, a professional quarterback on a football team, they are going to get more attention. They just are. And it's not about money. It's about the fact that we understand that, so wait a minute, this is crucial that this guy gets back to activity, you know? And, and they're used to pushing those limits because we know, I mean, I've seen professional athletes. I've worked with elite athletes. That's what I do. And when I see them, you know, the question isn't, do you want to play again? Do you want to run again? The question is, how soon do you have to be back performing at the same level? And then we have to figure something out. And that's part of it is I think that's so important is that when you go to those people and you find somebody that you have, um, you know, works with elite athletes, with professional athletes, with high level runners, and you go to that doctor, that physical therapist, and you just say, look, this is not optional for me. I may not be a professional athlete. However, this is crucial to me in my lifestyle. They understand that and they will treat you dif differently. They will treat you like an elite athlete. And you, you, know, you have to make it clear to them. Sure. Chris, uh, you know, it's amazing too. And I'll just, uh, what you were just saying here that they love to work with people, just everyday people too, who are passionate about something, passionate about this sport. Um, and it was funny, I was working with the physical therapist uh, in my rehab and I said, you know, I said, thank you for all these things you're doing for me. And they said, it was funny, they said, thank you for being in shape. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, they, they appreciated that I was trying to stay in shape to do this and that I was passionate about this stuff. So I would mm -hmm. take it serious. I would do what they're saying. I would imagine it's very frustrating for a person who's a physical therapist or a nutritionist or anything who says to somebody, this is what you can do. And then nothing's done. The person doesn't do any of that. I, mm -hmm. I can imagine how frustrating it is to give these people these, these, this guidance and then for them to not use it. And so, you know, I, I think that all the people I've worked with, not only have they been great for me, but I think they've been appreciative that I've been wanting to use all their wisdom and apply it to where I'm at. So, well, it, 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 it that's true. And I can tell you that, um, you know, as a doctor, when we have a medical term for it, we call them non-compliant patients, mm. you know, patient non-compliance and, it's, it's really simple. I mean, we, we think we know what will help with a certain thing. We think we know if you take this pill, your blood pressure will go down. If you take this pill, your blood sugar will not get so high. Mm. And yet, people do not take their medication. They do not do what they're supposed to do. They do not do the rehab. They don't stretch. They don't exercise. They don't do whatever. And over and over and over, it used to be a running joke in my office when I had a standard office where I would say, you know, after surgery, I would say, 
did you walk on your foot? No, not at all. Okay. Did you, did you, did you take the boot off at all? No, not at all. Okay. So you, you don't walk on it. You don't step on it. You kept the boot on the whole time. Okay. When you're sleeping without the boot, you ever have to wake up and go to the bathroom? Well, sometimes, Well, when you walk on it to the bathroom without the boot, does it hurt? Well, just a little bit. Well, wait a minute. I thought you just told me you lit. And like my <laughs> Sherry, my assistant would literally start laughing out loud every time she would say, but I thought you just told me you didn't walk on it and you didn't take off the boot. But then Literally 10 seconds later, you told me you were walking to the bathroom. Well, I'm just going to the bathroom, not really walking on it. That is a non-compliant patient. And it is extremely frustrating yeah. to uh, talk to someone who just will not do what we think is going to help them. And it is in incredibly gratifying to see somebody and we say, okay, this is the plan. We think this will work. And then you take the plan and you go execute. You do the work, not the doctor, right? Yeah. The do the making the plan is the easy part. Doing the work is the hard part, but when you do it, your physical therapists, your doctors, everybody on your team, it really is encouraging. It's uplifting. It's, it's, it's great. And yeah. uh, not everybody's able to do it. The why I like working with runners is that runners as a group understand you have to put in the work to get an outcome. It is not going to happen just because you took a pill. There, there is no pill like that. In fact, this morning, um, you know, uh, this morning, our, our, so, uh, Alex, our little boy says, uh, I wish there was one pill that you could take and never have to brush your teeth again. <laughs> and I mean, just this morning before school, and I was thinking, you know, it would be great to write a thing about um, the pill that you wish you could take at each stage of life. You know, I want to be a grown up. I want to not brush my teeth. I want to be young. I want to be skinny. I want to be fast. You know, I want to be smart. I want to not forget things but there is no pill for those things. It's about work. You have to put in the work to recover and get better. Sure. So what, so for all those people, you know, who are still kind of on the fence, they're frustrated, they're demoralized, they're even depressed because their doctor said, look, you need a total joint replacement. Um, and they've maybe been told they're not going to run again. I mean, what sort of words of encouragement can you offer them? Well, I would say once again, that, uh, it's, you know your body better than anybody else. You know your ability better than anybody else. Uh, people are trying to judge what your potential is based on their knowledge of you, but it is still one person's opinion of you looking at you from the outside. I mean, you know your heart. You know your mind. You know your level of uh, faith that you have in your ability. Um, and and I always, I'm, I'm a dreamer in that um, I think that there's far more potential out there than what we can readily see, mm. than, than what is the typical expectation. I love for a fact that as I get older, um, it's amazing how the bar for um, a 50-year-old man <laughs> is so much lower than a bar for when I was 35. Um, I love to smash that. I mean, I, I you know, and I, and I want people to, to do that too. I don't want them to take the world's expectations, which are so incredibly low for us in so many places and run with it. I want them to smash through those expectations because you can, you, you really can just have faith that what the doctors are telling you is, is the safest thing possible in many respects. And if you're willing, if you have enough belief in yourself, if you're willing to just push for what is possible, you can do it. You can do it. it there's, there's so much more beyond what is expected, what is the norm. And so they should go for it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, that really is the key. I mean, you have to believe that you can do it. And then all you do is set about the work. And I think that really is the point. And, and it's true. Like what you said was just really so interesting because our friends that think they know us, they're making decisions and telling us what we're able to do based on what they think they know about us, but they don't know us. We know ourselves better. And when I was doing Ironman races and I was kind of getting faster and faster, there was one event where I had basically set a new PR and I told one of my friends who to this day still is an elite cyclist. So he understands the possibilities of training, getting faster, winning and so on. But I told him, I said, well, in four months, I'm going to do this other Ironman. And I think I can chop an hour off my time. And he actually laughed at me and said, there's no way you can cut. And I said, why not? 
I mean, it's not like I'm racing at pro times or something. If you're a pro and you said you can take an hour off, that's different, right? But when you're, you know, like fast-ish, but not really fast, it's pretty easy to take off some big time. If somebody does a five-hour marathon and then the next year they want to do four, pretty reasonable, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're running two hours and a half, well, you're not going to chop an hour off, right? And and I just it just really struck me because I thought, I know who he is. I know how competitive he is. I know how well he's done throughout his cycling career. And I thought, how can he think I can't go an hour faster? I mean, I was barely tired when I finished. I basically executed my plan, finished exactly on time, and I wasn't worn out. So I know I can go an hour faster, but he doesn't feel that. He doesn't know that deep inside. And we as runners know that and we have to have that faith in ourselves. Sure. And I think another, another thing too that I do, and, and I would I would say people should do this more is, is visualize what you want to accomplish. I, I uh, you know, it's funny. Once again, you, you had Mark Allen on your show the, the before, and I think his nickname was the grip. I That's think right. I remember, That's uh, right. which is funny that I can remember that this, this long, that, you know, so far long ago, but what, to be honest, when I'm at the end of a marathon and I'm sure when I'm doing this 50 mile in March, you know, I'm going to envision Mark Allen, on NBC Sports, doing that Iron Man with those big Oakley sunglasses he used to have on, running down, you know, that that highway, and 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 use that as motivation. That you know, I, I can do this. I can do right. this. You know, and and almost envision myself being that world class athlete in right. that moment of significant challenge, so yeah. that it'll push me over the edge to envision that success when when I'm challenged the most. People need to do that, not just to um, not just to slip into what is normal, uh, what is expected, but to push beyond that. That's right. That's it. So, I mean, that's, I think, really great way to wrap this up. Do not slip into what's normal or what's expected, you know, because truthfully, what we expect out of ourselves is what we get out of ourselves. Mm. I mean, and that's the bottom line. So if we expect we're going to run five hours, we're not going to run four, you know, mm. and uh, you know, one of the races I did, my goal was to do 12 hours and it was 11 hours and uh, 57 minutes. And then the next one, which my goal was 11 hours, I did 10 hours, 59 minutes and seven seconds. But that's not a coincidence, right? It's about visualization. It's about deciding it's going to happen. And even that race you talked about with Mark Allen, you know, he talks in the interview about that, about how you know, for eight hours, he and Dave Scott are running literally side by side, stride for, you know, stride the whole way. And he already knew in his mind, because when he finally made a break for it, he said, you know, I knew that basically there was only one more uphill. Dave was faster than me on the downhills. And coming into town, you do not want to try to out sprint Dave Scott. And he knew that he would have to do something before he hit the downhill because Dave Scott was faster. And so he had visualized not just the race, not just w running down the finish chute ahead of Dave Scott. He had visualized and thought about what would happen on every section of that course. Mm. And, you know, that's really what it takes. It's like visualizing, I think, if you, you know, watching what you've accomplished and watching your progression on, uh, on uh, Instagram and the stuff you posted on Twitter about, you know, how you can actually progress through this, I think can really help people who need total joints really look at the possibility of something that's far beyond what most of our family members and doctors are going to tell us. And sure. that really is the key, right? Just like, um, you know, the four minute mile, right? Roger Bannister did it. Nobody had done it in the history of the world. Right. And then suddenly within a year, there's like all these people running four minute miles. And now it's, you know, lots of people run four minute miles because everyone knows it's possible. And until you know, it's possible, it is impossible. And that convincing yourself that it is possible, I think, is what's so key, which clearly you've been able to do. So, Eric, thank you so much for coming on today. So people can follow you at uh, uh, on uh, Instagram. It's the Bionic Runner, right? Yeah. And Twitter, yes. I think, is uh, Bionic Runner. Yep. And we can follow you on uh, Facebook and Strava as well, right? Yeah, just by my name. Just find me by my name, Eric Broncala. Yep. Okay, great. And we'll put all those links in the show notes. So if you go to this episode uh, on Doc on the Run under the podcast uh, section for this episode, we'll have all those links there where people can follow you um, and, and keep track of your progress and continue to watch you, you know, training and running marathons, qualifying for Boston and, can, and I guess doing the, uh, the 50 miler as well. So sure. yeah, be interested. Be yeah. 
So um, thank you again for taking time out of your schedule and um, um, uh, and coming on the show today. Thank you so much, Eric. Appreciate it, Chris. Thanks. Doc on the Run. We help injured runners run.